Hello, AP Stats. Again, this is Mr. Kim. Welcome back. Um, if you haven't watched my part one video, I suggest you do that first before you start watching this one. This is the part two. So I'm starting from question 22 um, all the way down to question number 30 to get through all the multiple choice as well as the free response questions that's on this packet. So let's start with 22 here. A manufacturer of balloons claims um, the proportion of balloons inflated up to diameter is no more than 0.05. So the proportion that they claim is 0.05. Um, some customers have complained the balloons are bursting more frequently. So if we want to conduct an experiment to test the alternative hypothesis, we must say that it's bursting in much more a greater proportion. So it's looking for greater than 0.05. And the only answer choice that actually contains that is B. So we're going to put that and we're going to move on. Well, number 23, consulting statistician reported the results from a learning experiment. To a psychologist, <clears throat> the report stated that on one particular phase of the experiment, statistical test, p-value of 0.24. Um, so 0.24, that is um, the value that you're going to use to evaluate the significance test based on the value, which is the following conclusion should the psychologist take. Okay, So um, they didn't really specify any significance level. The test was statistically significant because of the other percentage, 1 minus 0.76, but they never stated the significance level in the first place. And so... The, the A, B, and C, if you read them over, they really don't make any sense in terms of um, there was no a, uh, alpha level. The test was not statistically significant because two times 0.24. I mean, I, there is, that is irrelevant. I guess they're trying to say that that's the two-way um, proportion, like two proportion, like, you know, the going both ways. But that is... Either way, amongst all these answer choices, that's the best one that you can pick is either between it's D or E. So the test was not statistically significant because if the null hypothesis is true, one could expect to get a test statistic at least as extreme as that observed 24% of the time. Now, remember, you have to understand what p-value means. The p-value means that when the null hypothesis is true, the proportion of the times that you're going to get that specific sample is 24%. So the definition of what the p-value is, what you want to use, and the answer based on what we know about what the p-value means, it should be D for 23. Um, as lab partners, Sally and Betty collected data uh, for a significance test. Both calculated the same z-test statistic, but Sally found the results were significant at 0.05, and the Betty did not. Woman found that the only difference in their work is Sally had used a two-sided and Betty used one-sided. So what's the difference between the two? Well, if Betty uses one-sided, that means that they she used one z-score to evaluate the proportions in one way or the other, by the way. It could go either way because it doesn't specify what my alternative hypothesis says. It could be less or more. You never know. But for Sally's case, you know that it has to be this or that. So there's going to be two... Um, same z values on one positive one negative and you go two way um, proportion two sided test so we are actually taking greater than or less than as long as it's not equal to the null hypothesis parameter value all right so for number 24 as lab partners sally and betty collected for a significance test both calculate the same z test statistic but sally found the results were significant at the 0.05 level while betty found that the results were not when checking the results, the woman found that the only difference in their work was that Sally had used a two-sided test, while Betty used a one-sided test, which of the following could have been their test statistics. So when you read this question, it might seem a very, like, very confusing, but what's the word that's here that they said, which is the Sally found the results that were significant. Now, when we find the results that are statistically significant, it means that we have evidence to reject the null so that we can have alternate hypothesis to be true, because that's what it means to be significant. Whatever that they were trying to say, if they were trying to say, like, for example, um, up here that the divorce rate is 50% or, you know, something that's more than 50%. Um, if we're some, somehow trying to prove that the having the children with two first, uh, first years of marriage increases, 
you're trying to statistically signify the importance of alternate hypothesis, how valid it is. So whenever they say it was significant, it means that we reject the null. When we reject the null, it means that the probability, the p value, is less than alpha. So we are actually looking for p to be less than alpha when we're actually talking about something that's being that's being significant at that at that level. Uh, so when you guys actually do this, we are looking at Betty who's using a one-sided test, um, but was Sally that had used a two-sided test while well, Betty had used a one-sided test. So Sally were the ones who found it to be significant, but and Sally used a two-sided test. And that means that the proportion goes either way. And even with those two proportions combined together, it was still less. And this is what need, what the condition that needs to be met in order for you to call something significant, like it was significant at that level. So when you actually use, let's say, answer choice A, for example, I will show you each and every single one of these, like you're going to use normal CDF, right? And let's say I change this value. Actually, I'm going to just clear all this and then just go straight to the, the very beginning. So normal CDF and negative five. Oh, I already have it here. So let's say paste that. So this becomes 0 0.023. Now you might be wondering, wait a minute, doesn't that mean that Betty who used a one-sided test also found it to be significant because p-value is low? Well, not really because, well, first of all, if you double it, it gives you two-sided test and you can see how 0 0.0477 is less than 0 0.05. So that means actually Sally found it to be significant at the alpha level 0.05 because it's less than that level. Now, when you find a p-value to be 0 0.03 for one-sided test, you must understand that they didn't actually specify what the alternate hypothesis was. Did they say that the proportion was less or proportion was greater than whatever the parameter that they have declared? So in other words, what you have basically found is this at negative 1.98, this is the area that you found out, which was 0 0.023, which is fine. But for one-sided test, you can go either left or to the right of that value, which is this. So if you actually do one minus this number, so which is 0 0.97, this A means that if Sally had used a two-sided and Betty used a one-sided test, and Betty used one-sided test in such a way that at that particular Z level, P was greater in the alternate hypothesis. That's what they say. Let's say supposedly that's what they say. Then the chance of that happening is 0.97, which is obviously going to be greater than alpha. So it's no longer going to be significant. Now, if that's too confusing to kind of remember, just think of it this way. Let's say at any time when you get a p-value less than alpha, it's significant. So let's say I do second vars once again, and then I do normal CDF, and I use answer choice B, for example. So negative 1.69. So I put, put, put it all in, and then it's 0 0.04. Now, what happens when you double this? Now, when you do a two-sided test, now your p-value actually becomes greater than 0 0.05. This is why B can't work, because your p-value for two-sided test is 0 0.09, but it's gotta be less than the alpha level, which is 0.05 in order for it to be significant. It's pretty much the same deal with the rest of the answers. So let's say you do normal CDF, uh, 1.34, and then this is five. So that's 0.09, double it. It's still 0.18. It's still greater than 0.08. D is the same issue with B. It's the same Z level. So it's gonna give you the same answer. This is gonna give you 0.09. Uh, last one, let's say I do, um, oh, this calculator is actually, is it not working? Okay, there we go. So if we were to actually, let's say, do normal CDF, and let's say that we do um, 1.78, and then we double that. See, that's, how, that's still bigger than 0.05. So it's not going to be significant because it's bigger than 0.05. And that's simply what it's going to be. All right, so that's A. Uh, number 25, an independent research firm conducted a study of 100. So significant using 0.05. The program, program sponsors complained that the study had insufficient statistical power. What sort of would be appropriate method for increasing the power here? Okay. I mean, that's the only 
logical answer for this because we know how sample size impacts the power increase. So there we go. All right, so for 26, an environmental scientist wants to test the null hypothesis that an anti-pollution device for cars is not effective. Um, which of the, under which of the following conditions would type one error be um, committed? So type one error simply means that you reject the null, but then the null is actually true. So the null hypothesis, they actually state that an anti-pollution for device for cars is not effective. So that is actually the one that's true. So if we say the alternative hypothesis to this, it means that the anti-device for cars is effective when it's actually not. So it should be A. The scientists conclude that the anti-pollution device is effective. So that is your alternate hypothesis is what you're stating because they say that the null hypothesis is this when it actually is not. So H sub zero, the null hypothesis is the one that's actually true. Uh, 27, an experimenter conducted a two-tailed hypothesis test of 0.44. So that means that you could do this and this is 0 0.22 and this is 0 0.22. Um, which of the following is true about the possible p-values? Okay, so you have to be careful about this. If you just say A, the reason why it's not going to be A is because you also need to take a look at that the z-score can be here and it can shade from that z-score until down because they never state what the alternate hypothesis in the first place. Z-score can always de de um, determine the area to be shaded left or right, but that's really determined by the alternative hypothesis. If it's not stated, that it's gonna be higher, just 0.22. It could also be this part, which is the rest of 100%, 0 0.78. So the possible values for P is actually two, 0.22 as well as 0.78. A mass salt manufacturer is deciding which company to use. We have a sample size, and then we have a percentage, and then another percentage. What assumption appears to be a concern? Now, C, D, and E really catches my eye because N times P must be greater than or equal to 10 for the large counts, that condition for, to, for it to be satisfied, right? Now, when you take a look at the fact that 30% of 30 is actually nine, that is actually less than 10, it doesn't satisfy the large counts rule. That is the concern for this test. So it has to be C for number 28. All right, so now we're down to free response. Now, unfortunately, I cannot really write down all the things I want to write down for this, but I'll do my best. And if you could just please bear with me to my minimal writings that I'm doing, but for the actual test, you must state everything that I'm saying for you out loud in the most, for the most part. So state the hypothesis interest for this study. A school district, some water break here. Okay. All right, so a school district in North Carolina, have noticed increased skipping on the last day of school for several years by senior classes. Hope it doesn't become mine. This has presented problems for students with graduation, makeup, work, and more. Over the past five years, 39% of NC seniors have skipped. Okay, so that is a number that we want to use for part A, by the way. This year, state officials tried a new reward program sponsored by the local businesses who are seniors, where seniors at some of the schools had opportunities to win very nice prizes by the end of the day's combination last day and senior fest. This year, only 129 of the 398 randomly selected seniors were absent on the final day. School officials are trying to determine if this would be a program to implement statewide to improve senior class attendance on the final school day. So the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, let's determine what the p-value is and what that means in terms of context. So they want to reduce the percentage of the seniors who are skipping classes, which means a null will be equal to 0.39. So that means that the where, I'm sorry, I should start with where P is the true proportion of seniors skipping class on the last day of school. Okay, so that is the that is the parameter that we want to test. 
So identify the appropriate test. This is a one proportion uh, Z test because we only have one singular proportion regarding the senior skipping school and that's it. And so we have the state portion finished. We have the plan portion, which is this and checking for the three conditions random. We also must check randomly selected check there. 10% um, of the population is actually greater than the sample size here. Do we have enough evidence that there's more than 3,980 high school students out there or high school seniors out there? Yes, so check. Um, NP is greater than or equal to 10. I think that goes on without saying. Uh, 129 out of 398. Well, let's first solve for that here real quick. Okay, so my P hat value is 0 0.32. So if we take 0 0.32 times 398, I don't think we're going to have any issues with that. So that is 129, which is clearly bigger than 10, and 0 0.68 times 398, which is obviously way more, 270. So that's going to be greater than 10. So everything's checked out. So when you do the do portion, which is next, um, one thing I'm going to tell you right now is that the formula that you guys actually use, that's completely unnecessary. You can actually tell the AP um, examiners that you actually did the calculator for this, and you, but you must always um, tell them what the z-score and the p-value is when you do this. Um, so we are going to go to, um, what is it, stat, and then we're going to do test, one proportion z-test. And so the proportion that we want to test is 0.39. That's the null hypothesis that we said, which is right here. Um, X is a number of seniors who skipped out of the sample. And the null hypothesis is when it's less than. So to show you a picture, that's what we're looking at. You see how the z-score is really low. That blue shade on the very left is very visible, but that's what we want to determine. So let me go to stat once again test and then let's press calculate and boom there we go so you must find out the z score first you must inform the ap examiners and myself as to what the z score is then you say the p value is 0 0.00352 and this would be just as sufficient now the reason for this is because you only have about maybe 10 12 minutes per ap free response questions in the actual test, they're not going to expect you to sit there and plug all those values in piece by piece and waste all that time. So just use your calculator and get it over with. Okay, so conclusion statement. Um, since p-value is, I believe, less than alpha. Now, I know that they didn't specify 0.05, but in most tests, if they did not specify it for you, because they said perform the, oh, I'm sorry, they did say 0.05 here. Alpha level is 0.05. Yeah, usually if you don't if you don't see it, it's generally accepted as the idea that it's going to be 0.05. But luckily, I have this, so we reject the null. This means that there is a convincing evidence. That um, so when we reject the null, it means that the alternative hypothesis is true, and that the true proportion of seniors skipping classes, skipping class or skipping class or skipping school maybe on the last day is less than 0.39. So there is enough statistical, enough evidence to believe in the alternative hypothesis, which states that it's actually less than 0.39. So identify the type one error. Um, so let's see if the proportions to giving classes in favor of the alternative. Okay, so reject the null. The, the incentive percent of the senior skipping class is less than 39%. Okay, good. So the type, identify a type one error and one consequence of this error. So. Type one error means that we accept the alternative hypothesis. So we say that we want to implement this new reward program. program. And you fund it, you spend money on it, but the proportion of seniors skipping 
does not go down. Because when you make a type one error, it means that no hypothesis is actually true. So even when you spend all the money to actually fund the program, the proportion of seniors who actually skip the class on the last day stays the same. Therefore, it's not really gonna be effective. Type two means that you do not implement the new reward program. Because you have statistical evidence to say that um, the students who actually skip is about is going to be about 0.39 the national average as stated, I think, for the um, North Carolina or just in the state of North Carolina, my, excuse me. Um, do not implement the new rural program, however, should have because it would have had an impact or had an effect on lowering the pro uh, proportion of students I'm sorry, seniors, skipping class, skipping class on the last day. You can fill in the blanks there. So that would be the type two error in that regard. Remember, this is in your own words. So if you really just think about it and to see what the consequences of this would be, should you, should you actually implement this program? Yes or no. If you said yes, but it didn't really be effective, you know, what's the consequence of that? If you didn't implement the program, but you should have, what's the consequence of that? You know, in that regard, you know, just get the hang of what type one and type two error is at this point and just describe it in your own terms as to what it could be. All right, last question, number 30. So is there a convincing evidence to support the news agency's claim that more young male voters are changing? All right, so I think we have two proportions here. So we have proportion of men. I'm going to call that a piece of one, 123.87. And piece of two for the woman is 50 out of 248. So if you read this carefully, we're talking about a recent study of young voters, show the percentage of young men and women um, changing their political affiliation. Is there convincing evidence to support the news agency's claim? Now, when you want to do what you want to do is you want to start the whole process all over again. So we want to state state is a must. What is my null and what is my alternative and what is the P1 and P2? So the null hypothesis here would be that the proportion of the, the change in the political affiliation between men and women is exactly zero. That's how I taught you guys. That's what I taught, told you guys when I went over 9.3 with you guys, that the null hypothesis is equal to zero when you subtract them. So when you actually want to prove that is there enough evidence to support the news agency's claim that more young male voters are changing. So that means that proportion one, which is for male, that should be bigger than female, which is greater than zero. Where P1 represents the true proportion of male switching political affiliation. And you guys can pretty much say the same thing, but this is for a uh, female. Same words, same context, everything, but then represents a true proportion of females switching political affiliation. So that would be how to do the state portion. Now, of course, there will be plan and that would be the randomness. Do we have us? Do we have randomness? No, but we need to assume randomness for this because we have, um, I mean, it doesn't really say SRS or random. So we're going to assume randomness here. I know that if, so what happens if they didn't even really said that, you know, they didn't take a simple random sample here because we want, usually for these type of contexts, they should have, but for this one, I don't know why they didn't say it, but we are going to assume that it's randomness or do we have enough evidence to believe that um, this is going to be an independent sampling where all the proportions of men who change the political affiliation will be independent from how, other males would, uh, you know, change their political affiliation. Now, there's there, you could make arguments for those, I guess, but we are assuming randomness first. And for number two, it's really about the ten percent rule, right? Do we have enough evidence? Do we have, you know, in common sense wise, do you believe that there's more than two thousand four hundred eighty women out there, three thousand eight hundred seventy men out there? Yes. So ten percent check. N times P is greater than or equal to 10. N times P, oh, I'm sorry. N times one minus P is greater than or equal to 10. 
But remember that these are all going to be based off of your uh, combined proportions. Um, so N1, N2, and the P hat combined, all of those has to be greater than or equal to 10. Now, um, we can check for those real quick. So here, if I were to simply do PC hat, the sample um, combined, which is 58 plus 120, and then we have 387 plus 248. Then when we take 178 divided by this answer here, we get about 28%. Now, P combined hat is 0 0.28. When you take that number and when you multiply by the, the sample size here times 248, and then when you take this number again and multiply by 387, you get something bigger than 10. Now, it goes on without saying one minus this proportion. If you take that and multiply the respective sample sizes, that should also give you something bigger than 10. So everything will check. Now, when you take a look at the answer key, I know that they said proportions of one and two separately, and they checked for large counts that way. Um, in the textbook, also, textbook, however, they used um, P subscript C. I will give you a little bit more clarification on this um, on, on the, in, in this regard. If on the test, um, I will tell you which one to use if it, if it comes to that. But for now, always please just stick with the um, P subscript C. Um, I was always all under the impression that you're supposed to use P1 and P2 separately with its own respective sample sizes. But I don't know why the textbook told you to use the combined sample proportions. But I'll give you more clarification in that regard. But even if you were to use the um, P1 and then N1, P2, N2 like this, it will still give you something bigger than 10. So it's all good there. All right, so now um, plan portions finished. Now, obviously, the next part is due. And this time, we're going to do a two proportion Z test. So go to test, two proportion Z test. And it's going to be 58 out of 248 here. And then we're going to do, oh, I'm sorry. Because we're talking about P1, which is in male, I have to do 120 out of 387. Almost forgot, 58 out of 248. And then we're talking about where P1 is greater than P2 because that's what the alternative hypothesis is saying, which is right here. And then we're going to actually let's just draw and see what happens. So we are only looking for the proportion where P1 is greater than P2. So let's do stat, test, number six, the same thing all over again. There was a press calculate, bam. So um, we have the Z value at 2.08, P value is 0 0.0184. And so we have the alpha level also, um, I think they didn't specify for you, but like I said, if they didn't specify for you, just please just assume 0 0.05 for now. And that's what the answer key says. So we're gonna evaluate at that level as well. Now you can clearly see that P is less than alpha. So what do we say? We reject the null. Um, I believe that we have enough evidence to um, believe that the null, the alternative hypothesis is true. Reject the null, there, there is sufficient evidence or there's convincing evidence that P1 is greater than P2. Now I'm abbreviating this because I can't really put all the words in there, but I've already established what P1 and P2 represents for you. So what you wanna say is there is convincing evidence that the true proportion of males switching political affiliation is greater than the true proportion of female um, registered voters who, who are switching their political affiliation. So that is what I want you to substitute in place of P1 and P2. On the day of the test, nor the AP exam, please don't do that. I'm only doing it for abbreviation's sake. Okay, and I'm running out of space as well. So what's the type of error you could make? Well, if you reject the null, the only type and type mi error mistake you can make is type one error, um, which means that you reject the null and you believe that the more proportions of male switch affiliation but in reality, the proportion of male and female who are switching 
political affiliation. is about the same. Or you can say that the, the proportion of, maybe I, I don't think I should be saying this, but the proportion of male registered voters, voters who change their political affiliation is not greater, is not necessarily greater um, than the proportion of female who switched political affiliation. In the answer key, I believe they said that it was, um, we think that the proportion of male voters who change affiliation is greater but then this is not the case. So it's simply, I don't think I should say that the same because we're stating something that's actually um, for the null hypothesis, but we simply wanna say that the alternative hypothesis statement that proportion of male um, voters are not necessarily bigger than the female registered voters of the proportions. So proportion of male who switch political, political affiliation is not necessarily greater than the proportion female who switched their political affiliation, blah, blah, blah. All right, so part C, construct and interpret 99% confidence interval um, level. Oh boy, so this is, has been a while, but I think this was just a review from chapter A. So let's go over this real quick. We're gonna still state, plan, do, and interpret for a 99% confidence interval. So state, um, statement, we always want to state that um, the uh, nine, we're constructing a 99% confidence interval and then confidence interval for this one. And to state what the p-value is always, and this is a two sample Z proportion test and the same parameter as P. So uh, parameters P, you guys, uh, you can actually take a look at from part A's answer, P1 and P2. So P1 is for male, P2 is for female, the true proportion of the registered voters to actually change political affiliation. We're constructing a 99% confidence interval, true proportion Z test, once again. Um, two proportion, I'm sorry, interval. I think it's interval Z test. Two sample Z interval. So we wanna construct two sample uh, Z interval test, okay? And then we're gonna use our calculator to do the most of our calculations anyhow, and we're simply gonna be looking for that. Plan, again, same context as before. I think we already did this. So randomness, 10% rule, and n times P greater than or equal to uh, 10. So when we do the actual do portion of this, uh, we go to stat, we go to test, but if you go all the way down to C, um, uh, B, just two proportions Z interval test. So this is the same thing here, but then we're just gonna change our C level to about 99%. And then we're gonna press calculate and then bam. So the do here, what you wanna write down is the interval 0 0.0158 comma 0 0.16819. And then we can figure out what that crit, um, the, uh, critical value would be, but which is right in the middle of these two. So if I go to like 0 0.0, negative 0 0.0158 plus 0 0.16819 divided by two. So the critical value with the middle value of these two will be 0 0.076 with a plus and minus the margin of error um, with this being mine 0 0.1, 0 0.16819 minus the critical value so we're talking about a margin of error being plus or minus 0 0.09195, about this much. Okay, so interpret, we are 99% confident that the interval will capture the difference in the true proportion difference in the true proportion of male registered voters versus the female registered voters. Okay. All right. So once I take a look at the answer key and everything looks good. Yes. And then don't forget how we actually phrase the interpretation portion for the confidence interval. I know it's been a while. And if you're wondering, am I going to, is Mr. King going to put this on the test? 
I don't want you to be surprised. Um, please feel free to interpret it however you want with that last statement, but you need to know. Either way, you need to know how to construct a confidence interval at this point. And most importantly than that, constructing a, a significance test that is much more important for chapter nine anyhow. So make sure you know how to do any sort of um, constructing confidence, whether it's confidence interval or significance test, you should be ready for that. Okay, so I hope this helps. This is the extent of how much chapter nine resources I can uh, um, provide for you. Um, please go ahead and just take a look at these, try to do as many questions as possible. Um, again, try to do it again and make sure you get type one, type two errors, p-values, null and alternate hypothesis, how to evaluate them, what does the p-value really mean um, in terms of null and what does power mean? Please get through every single one of those before Tuesday. Come back with your questions on Monday when we come back. We'll have a Q&A session. Other than that, um, have, have a pleasant day. I will upload chapter 10 video shortly for you guys. Thank you guys so much.